Good morning. My name is Earl Delat, and I am the Resource Development Coordinator for ESCO. Today, we're going to talk about classroom and lab, uh, lab best practices. Um, we're going to be talking with ESCO team members, and I'll let each one introduce themselves. Uh, Tom, go ahead. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is uh, Tom Tebby. I'm the uh, Program Director for the Education Resource Center for HVAC Excellence. Uh, very briefly, my background is a uh, teacher of HVACR and administration in HVACR, plus technician, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that uh, puts me in a position to talk a little bit intelligently about some of the things we need to be concerned about in the classroom. Yeah. Um, I was you know, basically a, a, a gopher, a technician, a company owner, uh, worked in a classroom and then stepped into actually uh, running the NAIT certification program. And now I'm happy to be a member of the ESCO development team where we make sure the educational material we produce helps all the educators do a better job of teaching our future generations. Good job, thank you. Uh, Lim? Uh, my name is Lim Palmer and I taught in the trenches for 30 years. and. My wife often tells me that I need to write a book about all the experiences. So if it's probably happened in the classroom, I probably experienced it. Okay, well, this is important. Um, this, this discussion we're gonna have is extremely important for I think for all instructors, not just new instructors. Um, the question that always comes up is that when you have an issue, the first thing you're gonna say, well, I didn't know that. And wow, I wished I would have known, uh, could have stayed out of trouble. So we're going to kind of lead into um, some of those issues and we won't cover everything. It's almost impossible to cover everything. So uh, we'll lead into things and um, we'll discuss them between the four of us. All right. The first of all, first off, let me. Um, say from the beginning we are not attorneys or legal professionals um what we're going to do is give information presented um from our classroom experience and things you should be aware of um that you cannot cover we cannot cover all possible scenarios but we do want to try to cover as many of them that we can our goal is to make sure educators are aware of a few issues that can affect their teaching career. And um, some of them can be quite costly. So our goal is just to make you aware of a few landmines that can derail your teaching career. Okay, we're gonna go from here. Tom, anything on um, student records? Well, let me just say this very briefly about student records. Student records are very private. And I'll just basically mention the, uh, I think it was a 1969 Supreme Court decision regarding privacy uh, of students and freedom of speech of students. And I think one of the things we really need to keep in mind is what the federal government or the Supreme Court mentioned back then. And that is that when teachers and students pass through the schoolhouse gate, they do not shed their constitutional rights. So they must be treated as adults at all time, and we must be cognizant of their right to privacy and freedom of speech. Uh, I think that's, that's very important. The whole idea to me of today's session is to make us aware, sort of like being a Boy Scout, be prepared, know where you stand, know what you can and cannot say and cannot do. And by being aware and being knowledgeable, just those things themselves help you protect yourselves against any possible forthcoming legal litigations, problems, accusations, and so forth. Uh, I'll let some of the other team members mention that obviously when you're protecting somebody's rights that you are also protecting uh, the way that they're treated, uh, uh, their safety in the classroom and so forth, because that becomes the responsibility of the instructor. So my, 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 my thing there is, be aware that they are to be treated as adults, treated with respect, have all the rights to privacy and all of the rights to freedom of speech within reasonable limits. Good, Pat? Yeah, uh, you know, when you're looking at the um, student records, you, 
you have a number of different records, but uh, one of the most important records is the student's grades. And when you're giving those grades out, they're the property of the student. Um, if they want to share it among their peers, they can, but when you hand the papers back, they, they should not be you know, pointing out that um, you did really well or you didn't do really well. Um, and if a student has a question on it, they can always come up to you and ask you questions. Well, why was this answer wrong? Um, I saw one the other day about a heat pump, and one of the answers was it only does heating and cooling. But the second answer was it does heating and dehumidification. And the, the, it, there's two correct answers there. So remember when you're giving tests back out to keep the information separate for each student. And then if they want to share the information, it's totally up to them. But sharing that information is their prerogative and not ours. Great point. Lim? Well, my example would be an experience I had here. I had a student that was 34 years old and his father came into my office and says, I want to see my uh, son's uh, grades. And I said, uh, uh, sorry, sir, I can't show you your son's grades. And he said, why? He says, I'm paying for his education. He says, I should have all those rights to see those grades. And I said, no, sir, unless you have the right form signed by your son, I can't show you his grades. And uh, it was kind of fun. He said, well, send my son in here into your office and give us a little bit of privacy. So a few minutes later, he had all the paperwork signed. And of course, he could see his uh, students grades. So it does extend that far. I mean, it is uh, private to the student. I, you know, even though the father was paying for his education, uh, he didn't have any rights to see his uh, students uh, grades, his son's grades, till he had permission. Good point. Tom, I know you have something on safety you can share with us. Well, sa safety is, is very important uh, for the protection, if you will, of, of, of the instructor. And it really comes down to this. If you don't have proper documentation, uh, I think we've used the terms in uh, past discussions that you really have no defense. So I'll just give an example as Len did. Uh, we had a, uh, a ladder safety issue many years ago. And very briefly, uh, a former student, unfortunately, uh, passed away and was killed due to uh, uh, being electrocuted, being on an aluminum ladder. Uh, there was obviously uh, depositions taken and so forth. And uh, the state of Louisiana was represented. I was the teacher. And the first question was, do you have any evidence that ladder safety was taught in the class and do you have any evidence that the student was aware that aluminum ladder should not be used for any type of electrical work well i said i have to go back but i can show you in the curriculum where it's taught they said well telling us that it's taught doesn't tell us that he actually knew or that he took a test or there's any evidence so i went back and thanks to a, an accreditation by coe uh, which is a an institutional accrediting body I did what they said many years earlier, and that was I documented all safety and had the student sign an affidavit at the end of the test saying, I have received safety training and such and such, understand all of the rules and regulations and will abide by them, sign it and date it and save them indefinitely, which I did. I brought that back. And of course, we were, the state of Louisiana and myself was a, a, a immediately dismissed from the case. Hallelujah say the least. But from then on, it became a uh, practice in the state of Louisiana. The uh, superintendent said, let's do that for all classes. Present the program, have the students sign off and sign that. That way there's no question as to whether were they at the class that day, did they miss school that day, did they take the test, did they miss the question, did you go back and explain it? Just highlight the rules that were taught, have them sign the data that they had proper instruction, will follow the rules and you know abide by them, sign it, date it, and you're more than likely protected or at least seriously limited any liability you may have. Uh, the last thing on the list, I guess I'll go ahead and take is copyright. Um, 
when you're creating or reproducing anything um, for your class materials, you have to be aware of copyright infringements. And um, this is something probably <laughs> every instructor is a little bit guilty of, of, of copying uh, things and um, giving them to the class. And um, you can get in a lot of trouble. Um, I know from experience, we had a, an instructor that not only copied things, but sold it. And um, <laughs> needless to say, he was in court within a matter of a month. So um, when we start making or copying materials, just make sure you have the rights to do that stuff because you never know um, when somebody's going to, a student could get mad at you and turn you in. So I, I think um, all of these, we're going to go into more detail as um, we talk about them later. All right. Tom, I'm going to let you talk about this one because I know you're um, real familiar with um, with men's ray. So I'll let you get into a little bit of this. Well, I would just like anybody watching to understand that men's, men's ray is a legal term. And it's, it's generally taught in all uh, school law classes. And all it really comes down to is, is an awareness that every individual that supervises or manages a class, a business, or anything else should be aware of. And that is how the courts de determine liability and the severity of a case or a claim against an individual. Uh, as it says on the slide, it's a Latin term for the state of mind. What state of mind was the individual in? So if you look beyond school law and look at civil law and criminal law, it's, it's obvious that there's different degrees of punishment and different degrees of offenses. For example, I'll just go ahead and use murder. You got first degree murder, second degree murder, manslaughter, involuntary manslaughter, and on down the line because the prosecutor has to look at the state of mind of the individual at the time the incident uh, or, or crime occurred. So what it really comes down to is the four things, uh, bullets or five bullets that we have here. If a person is acting purposely, that means they, they know something is wrong and they decide to go, to go ahead and do it anyway, that's a very serious offense. The defendant had an underlying conscious aspect of doing the act. So that the, the punishment, the liability financial uh, in the case of schools and so forth would be very serious. Acting knowingly, the defendant is practically certain that the conduct uh, will cause a particular result. They're not sure, but they know that if they do something in the classroom or allow an instruct a student to do something, maybe request that they do something, that uh, there's, a, there's a risk here, but I don't think anything would happen. Uh, then you're acting knowingly that there may be a negative result to the act action. Recklessly, you consciously disregard uh, a substantial and unjustified risk. You know there's a risk, but you say, ah, what's the likelihood of something happen? So the prosecutor or whoever's looking at the case is saying, was that the incident? But the one that really uh, means the most to me is the last one, the least severe of them all, and that's acting negligently. And listen to the words of this closely. The defendant, the instructor, if you will, or student was not aware of the risk. But we'll talk about the instructor. I'm not aware of the risk, but but I should have been because of my position with the company and what I do. I'm a teacher. So the government looks at that. You know, you say you weren't aware of it, and we kind of believe you, but the position you hold as an instructor. Uh, we just can't accept that as, as an excuse. In your profession, you should have been aware that there was an inherent danger in that particular in, in a particular case or incident. So act, acting negligently is something you, you, you really want to think about. Remember the old term we all heard, uh, uh, ignorance is no excuse of the law. That's back, basically what number four means. You can't just sit there and say, oh, I didn't know any better. If you're a teacher and it's in your realm of what you do, then maybe you, sh you should have known better. The same of all of these things apply to students. So what it really comes down to, the only point I want to make is as you move further down, uh, you know, in men's rate to the intent or your state of mind at the time, 
the less likely you are to have any severe consequences for any inappropriate actions. So I'm just saying, be aware, you're a teacher, and as all of the team members have, have suggested, there's all types of things you need to be aware of, not to be afraid of, but just be aware of and be knowledgeable of in order to protect yourself and your class and your position and your career. That's all. Great point, Tom, and, and, and no, that was well done. Pat, can you add anything to that? I'm, I'm going to give a classic example, I think. You know, you, you, you know it's wrong to cut the grounding leg off an extension cord. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know it's wrong, you're aware of the risk, and then you did it anyway. So you, you have opened yourself up for somebody getting electrocuted. You know, you, you have to, just like on a construction site, um, you know what your your team members should be able to do and you have to protect them so they don't get hurt. So it, you, you can't have ignorance being a defense. Um, you have to be careful. You have to know this stuff and it just takes time. And if you have any questions, go to your administration. They have rules in the administrative level at the school then at the state level and at the federal level, which is where men's rate comes from. So you can you can make sure that you have all the information so you can make sure that your students learn the proper stuff. Good. Liam, anything you want to add? I think that subject's been covered pretty well. Uh, ignorance is not uh, an excuse. So educate yourself get your prepared self prepared for anything that can happen out there that's my advice yep great points all right the next one um what can i do to protect myself in my career uh lim <laughs> I, when I first started teaching, when I first started teaching, I come out of a situation where I was involved in a lawsuit. So I was very uh, concerned about the issue of being sued by students. And when I started my teaching career, the kind of the first thing I've done was join the local KEA, the Kentucky Education Association. And it wasn't because I was scared of my rights on the job. It was because of the insurance and the lawyers and the things that they had within their association that could protect me as a teacher. Now, it didn't give me an open right to do something stupid, but if something happened that wasn't my fault, then I knew I had a resource to go to. I was also paranoid to the fact that I had a, a, a policy on my home owner's insurance that covered me for uh, liability of students and those type things. So uh, my advice to teachers out there is look into those associations, how they can help you if you get into one of those situations that you need lawyers or you need legal help. and. Uh, you might want to check on your homeowner's insurance to see if you can get some kind of policy that kind of gives you a little bit of protection. You, you, you don't want anything to ever happen like that or any cause to ever use any of that. But uh, it's called insurance and uh, protecting yourself is part of your responsibility. Thank you, Earl. Yeah. I agree, Lim, and I, I also had a right on my homeowner's insurance. I just want to say it's really cheap uh, when you look at how much protection you're getting. So uh, it's it's a good thing to carry, as, uh, and I think every instructor should do this. Um, Pat? Yeah, you know, if, if you look at the uh, joining of the associations and carrying the extra coverage, the associations are absolutely fantastic in providing you the information, let's say, on you know what you can do in the classroom, what you can't do in the classroom. Um, the associations usually have that information. They've worked with that information before, so they can make sure you know your your first year of teaching um, isn't a big stumbling block because they can help to guide you along with a mentor being there 
to you know make sure you're not doing the wrong thing. So get those extra coverages, um, uh, join the trade associations so that you can have the information that they offer. A good point. Tom, anything you wanna add? I, I just very briefly, I'd like to say, you know, obviously uh, what we're talking about now primarily is protecting ourselves financially by carrying rider policies, joining national education associations and so forth. And one of the other team members just said it so eloquently a little while ago, one of the best things you can do, and Pat just alluded to it again, or stated it again, and that is learn all of the uh, policies and procedures that are acceptable by the administration and your state. Just be, be aware of them and practice them. Anytime you're not sure of something, get a, get a direct answer first. Don't take chances. Uh, we definitely want all of the financial protection we can get in the event something happens because things do happen. But to minimize the, the, the stress that you'll go through, try and protect yourself by being quite aware and knowledgeable in all the rules and regulations as they apply to your position. Great point. All right. What are the potential issues between teachers and students? We've listed um, a lot of these and um, uh, Pat, I'll let you lead off. I Safety is paramount. You you have students in the classroom who really um, possibly don't know anything about working with the tools and equipment that they're going to be subject to. Teach them the safety. Um, make sure it's in your lesson plans. Check with your administration to see how they want the lesson plan so you have the documentation for that safety. Uh, treat everybody in that classroom equally on, on teaching them. Um, budgets is always a big thing. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're providing a thorough and efficient education. Well, part of that efficiency has to do with the budgets to make sure you have enough money to do what's necessary in a classroom. Because with the tools changing today, you have to have those budgets to get the most current tools because the students are going to be working with them when they get out of the classroom. Discipline is really important. Um, you, you know, you don't want to start off um being too hard but you have to set a line where you know you're going to provide an equal education to all of them and if there's going to be a lot of cutting up and things like that you have to make sure that that doesn't happen you can always loosen up after the class has been uh, in operation for a couple of months and give them a little bit more leeway but remember this is a profession you've left one profession where possibly you know it it was time to leave the work in the field because your knees were um, finally giving out on you and you just can't bend down like you used to. Um, and you know, you were a professional technician for years, you have the knowledge, but now it's time to impart it to the new generation. And all these items go into making sure that the new technicians can do the same job, if not better than when you did it as a field service specialist. Agreed. Uh, Lim? Well, you know, I kind of got an example of the potential issues that can happen between teachers and students. Uh, I would always ask my class uh, at the first of the class, how many people in the class ever tore a toaster apart? And uh, I'd ask them to raise their hand and uh, nobody in this particular class raised their hand and i said it's kind of interesting that nobody in the class ever tore a toaster apart or their mother's <laughs> vacuum cleaner I, you know i tore everything my mother had apart trying to see how it operated and uh one student raised his hand and said mr palmer why would i want to tear a toaster apart so and that deals right back with safety you know, we're dealing with kids today that uh, haven't had their hands on things. They haven't tore things apart and looked and investigated. Uh, they've looked at them on a screen on a, a computer maybe to see how things work. But, uh, you know, uh, those actual hands-on experience that we had as young people, you know, aren't happening. So uh, safety becomes a big issue with students that really don't understand what they're working with. So, uh, you know, you got to be real careful with that, with the, the kids that we're having today, the experience, the life experiences that they've had, 
are just not there. Uh, when it comes to lesson plans, you got to have a plan. You know, anybody that's taking a trip, the first thing you got to have is you got to have a map. You got to know where you're going and how you're going to get there. Lesson plans accomplish that. You've got to work with administration. You know, sometimes it's hard. Uh, you know, I butted heads with administration many times about the issues or problems or things that I needed in my class. You know, so you, you got to deal with them. You got to learn to do that. Equal rights. Man, that is an issue that is covering this nation today. Everybody's got to be treated equal. And you've got to focus on that. It is an issue that you have to work with within yourself. Budgets, I used to fight with the uh, nursing profession all the time about uh, getting money or budgets to buy equipment for my class. So you just got to hang in there, keep on working on that and never give up. Discipline, you got to be straight up. Everybody's got to be treated to fair. Start off, you keep your, your uh, mark in the sand. You don't go over it and you don't cross it. Professionalism, that's important. If you don't act professional, then how do you expect your students to respect you? These are all pretty good issues. And you really got to work on them as a teacher today. Tom, anything you want to add? I, I would just like to add one thing that everybody has emphasized, and that is the importance of professionalism. I, I think when you transition, uh, either from directly from school or from the field in, into the classroom, it's a totally different occupation. You're no longer a technician, you're a professional, as Pat said. And I think we have to realize that as, as the teacher, you are the leader of the class. Uh, you have to be present the proper appearance if you expect others to follow. You have to be prepared to teach your class, not lollygag around in the morning but start your classes on time. You have to have the right attitude toward the subject matter. You have to have the right attitude toward working with the students. You have to exhibit the proper professional type behavior at all times. Remember, when you enter the classroom, if you're enthusiastic and you're upbeat that morning and telling the students you have a great day prepared, many objectives to meet, exciting classes, things to learn, that sets the stage for their attitude. You come prepared and ready to start, they're ready to start. If anything that you exhibit in a negative aspect, that to them is the default attitude and everything that they can exhibit for the day. I think, I think that's so very important. The other thing that everyone's talked about was equal rights and equal treatment. Something that's difficult to do initially, unless you've got your mind on it, is treating everybody equally, fairly, no bias involved. And the distinction I want to make is some of your students may be 17 and 18 years old. Some of the students you have may be 25, 30, 35, or 40 years old in some of the post-secondary classes. You're not supposed to lean to one as opposed to the other. They all follow the same rules. They all treated with respect and dignity. They all are required to do the same assignments in the same time frame. Don't ever get into the situation where you started treating groups of people primarily on age differently from, from, from another group. And that's all I wanted to add. Good point. Uh, one of the things that I see um, happening um, at different schools is uh, following curriculum. And I, I think this is probably one thing that gets more teachers in trouble than anything is um, you know, this semester I'm teaching heat pump to the senior um, students that's already in a class. So anybody new coming in, they just fall right into that class. They haven't had safety. They haven't had tools and materials. They had no theory of, of refrigeration, no theory of electricity. But yet you're going to put them into a class that they shouldn't even be in. And I think this is where a lot of people get in trouble at is putting students in advanced classes before they've had any of the core classes. So that's my two cents on this. Anybody? Oh, I'm good. All right. Um, so what do you do if you have an issue? Um, 
this was pretty cut and dry. Uh, Pat, go ahead and take this. Uh, basically follow the chain of command. Yeah, I, I, exactly. Um, usually at your department head and your administration, um, if need be, you can go to your local association or um, if things really get bad, then you got to go to your insurance carrier. So, Tom, anything you want to add? No, that's it. Pat said it. Uh, follow, follow the procedure. Yeah, um, chain of command. That's simple. Setting rules. Um, Lim, go ahead and take this one. Did we lose Lim? I think we lost Lim here for a second. Um, Pat, I think go uh, ahead and setting up. rules. Okay, I'm sorry. We lost you for a second, uh, Lim. Go ahead. Uh, setting rules are very, very important. You need to equally apply them to students. You, you need to have them written down. Uh, if you have a rule that students can't eat or drink in a classroom, then you need to follow that, and you need to follow that as an instructor. Uh, you need to not compromise on your safety rules. Uh, you, you need to... Uh, uh, keep accurate records of what's going on in your class, uh, syllabuses and lesson plans, and, and, and take notes of what has worked in your class, in your presentations, and what didn't. Uh, after you present a class, you really need to sit down, go into your office and say what worked and what didn't work. Because if it didn't work, you don't want to do it again. Just repeating the same mistake over and over just gets the same results so uh you need to sit down and and take a note of what you've done in your class and this is a process that takes time you just can't do it overnight and if you're in the teaching profession then you're hoping to be there for 20 to 25 years uh, i used to tell my administration that i've been doing this long enough that uh, you tell you pick a lesson in my particular class, give me five minutes and I'll be ready to teach it. But that was developed over years of teaching and taking the time to look over how I taught and the results that I got. So uh, keep records, even of things that work, even things that doesn't work. Uh, attendance. The story I can tell about attendance is I'd have employers call me. Well, Mr. Palmer says, uh i'm thinking about hiring this student and he's put you down as a reference and i said okay uh let's talk about him he said no i said i just got one question how was his attendance said if he can't show up to work says i can't use him so you know i used to tell students that attendance was very very important and uh, if they didn't show up to class then how would an employer expect them to show up to work so uh, keep that attendance uh, important in your class and explain to students that it is an important part of their future work experience that they'll need to show up. And, you know, I had students, well, if I was getting paid, it'd be different. No, it's not. It's an no, it's attitude. Not. And it's an attitude that, yeah, it's an attitude that teachers can teach. And they teach it by sticking to the attendance policy by starting their classes on time. One of the things that I was noted for in my profession when uh, I taught was Professor Palmer ex starts his class at eight o'clock. At eight o'clock, I started my instruction if there was one student sitting in the class or if all of them were sitting there. And all the students soon realized that, well, if I'm not there, on time I'm going to miss something so uh, those type things are all important in your teaching and that's how you teach students by actions not by words yeah Tom you know anything you want to add I, I, would, just you, like, I would just like to add uh, one one thing regarding uh, attendance and we've already talked about accuracy in record keeping because of liability and so forth. That is your defense, is the accuracy of your records. Attendance is, uh, I'd like to talk about it in the sense of 
not keeping pop, pop, proper records for a second. We had two incidences in my 30 years in education regarding attendance records where uh, the federal government actually charged instructors with falsification of records. And the issue was this, they confiscated all attendance records, all files from the instructor's office during class, sequestered the class, asked questions, and conducted a two-year investigation of the instructor. The accusation was that the instructor was allowing students to leave early and marking them present. No, I'm leaving at 2.30, school's not over three. Well, I gave you credit for the, uh, the entire day. That's falsification of records. And, and the charge was somebody dropped a nickel. It was false in both cases, but somebody had a bone to pick with the instructor and claimed that they were splitting money from GI students that were receiving money from the GI bill and marking them present on days when they were actually ab absent. So they took the records and then checked to see if maybe that student was working or at the hospital, but marked present. Man, it's just nothing to fool with. If a student's there, they're present. If they leave early, they're not there. You mark it down. Keep accurate records to protect yourself and to protect the students. It, it does, it does, it works for both. And I just like to mention that, that keeping the records is one thing. Keeping accurate records is critical because you can defend it. So when you got that student that wants to leave an hour early and you're making, make, marking present for the entire, entire day, uh, keep in mind if something happens to him during that hour when he left and they come back and check your record two days later, they're going to say, well, according to the instructor, he was in school. Don't take that chance. Keep accurate records. It's that simple. Yep. Uh, Pat, anything? In, in regard to attendance, I mean, I, I literally set up a, uh, a grading sheet for every student on all the information for the day. And, you know, they've got so many, so many points, just like a paycheck on a job. They got so many points for, you know, being at their desk on time, ready for the lecture. They got, you know, just like on a construction site, you know, you show up late for a construction site, somebody's not ready to work and the other uh, team members at the construction site aren't gonna be able to get their job done because there's somebody missing. So you have to keep the accurate records. It, it applies to everybody. As Lem said, you start on time. You, you don't compromise the safety. I mean, I have two classic examples. One student, uh, the contractor came back and he said, you know, he's on work study, but he says, you never taught this particular subject. I brought him in, showed him my records for that day. And when he looked at the information for the student during the lecture, he said, well, what does the S stand for? Satisfactory? I said, no, it stands for sleep. Notice the legend at the top of the page. The student <laughs> slept through the lecture. Now, the contractor wanted to know why I let him sleep through a lecture. I wasn't going to compromise the safety of any of the other students in the classroom. I was going to let him sleep because he's tired. He could hurt somebody else. The other classic example was one who was out on work study. He was late for that job every day. He was fired after a week. He used to be late coming into my classroom. He would get graded that way. And quite honestly, the contractor said to me, he shows up every morning with breakfast. He has to stop for breakfast. He got graded accordingly for not following the rules of showing up on time, being ready for his job, and it was reflected in his attendance. So apply those records and, and rules to everyone and keep them accurate. Follow your lesson plan and your syllabus, and you will make sure that you've got the line of defense and keep the records. Today with computers, you have no problem keeping the records more accurately. Um, you know, paper and pencil is a little bit more laborious, but having the records on a computer, you can just type it right in and you're done. Yeah, good point. Yep. All right. Working Carol? with various personalities. Yes. I just wanted to make one point. I, I, I failed to say that in the case, that I, the two cases I was uh, involved in, in protecting the instructors, both, both of them were found innocent. Their records were, in fact, as they were instructed, kept very well, and there was no charges brought against them. Oh, fantastic. Yep, good stuff. All right, working with various personalities. Pat, you want to take off on this uh, one? You know, as, as 
as you work with different personalities, it's just like being on a, on a job site. I tie it back, you know, you, you're going to have some guys who are going to want to sit there and complain about turning a wrench. Another guy is going to talk all day long about the sporting programs. Then there's the guy who knows how to turn a wrench and will tell you how to turn a wrench no matter what. Other guys are going to be quiet. How do you handle all these different personalities? Uh, you, you have to handle them all equally, as we know. You, you've got to maintain your cool. You've got to talk to them at the appropriate time. Um, you have to make sure if there's an issue, you know, you, you could have a sleeper in the classroom. Well, uh, there was another sleeper I had, and we found out that he had a problem at home. And it was one of those issues where, again, he wouldn't be safe to the other people in the classroom, but the sleeper problem actually had to go up the chain of command because there was a um, an issue of, of abuse at home. So you have to look at that. And, you know, in the state that I taught in, it was one of those things you had to report those things. If somebody's not interested, why aren't they interested? Um, is this what they're going to do? One guy literally told me, he said, oh, I don't care about this classroom because I'm going to be driving a garbage truck. My father's already got me a job doing it. Um, others, yeah, well, some of them will want to change the subject. And, and, you know, you just have to bring it back and refocus on the HVAC or you're teaching. And then there's always going to be somebody giving a, an inappropriate comment at the wrong time. Um, you just have to look at them and say, you know, that, that really doesn't fit in with what we're teaching right now. If it happens more than once, you have to pull them aside and discuss it with them. But you never embarrass the students in front of everybody else by saying, you know, something that would, you know, cause them harm in relationship to their other working relationships in that classroom. Uh, good point. You know, I had a, a student that was a um, sleeper and um, I kind of inquired with him, had a long talk and come to find out he had a sleeping disease and he thought he was um, getting better. And uh, one day the students came into the classroom. It was early in the morning. They said, Mr. Delat, um, so-and-so student uh, was out by the red light and um, he's sound asleep in his car. And I said, what do you mean he's at the red light? He goes, he's at the red light. Everybody's blowing a horn and he's out like a light. And I was like, you're kidding. So walked out there. Sure enough, he was still sleeping at, at the red light. So went and knocked on the window and he's like, Hey, what are you doing out here? And I was like, man, we come to check on you. Uh, at that point, he knew he had to get some serious help and uh, became one of the best students I ever had because he, he got help and um, actually got cured and went on to um, become a um, a great uh, operating engineer. So um, that's all I really have to say about that. Tom, anything? Uh, I would just like to say that uh... You know, I'd like to add one sort of uh, to the list, if I may, and that's late arrivals. People are constantly late. But uh, oh, this all has to do with, obviously, classroom management. And if you're taking any type of professional education classes, you'll learn a, a lot more about how to deal with the complainers, the talk of the people, and so forth, in a positive way, uh, as Pat said, to not embarrass them. But as you know, as you know, there are times as you get to know your group, what the, what the boundaries are that you can work within. And the, uh, I would just like to share with the audience that when it comes to the late arrivals, uh, there was a way that uh, different instructors handled it. And one way was not to deliberately embarrass the student, but to teach them to take responsibility for their own actions. Example being very briefly, student comes in late, starts talking to the students in class, disruptors, and you may say, well, Mr. X, why are you late today? Well, my mother didn't have my lunch ready on time. And I'm talking 20-year-old, 25-year-old. Say, oh, well, that's a shame. Next day they're late. Oh, my mother had to go to the bank and get my, get my lunch money because she didn't have time to fix any money. Oh, okay, great. Goes on two or three times. You say, well, obviously we know what you're... Tom, we lost you there for a second. Are you still there? Problem is, and I'm doing a very good job of helping to help you. I'm going to call you, helping you get an education. So I did that. I think we lost time for a second. Liam, anything you want to add? 
Well, you know, on this list of things, complainers is the one that'll grade on you the most. Anybody that's always constantly complaining, it will just grade on you. As a teacher, this was my oh, really? biggest thing that I had to work with was the complainers. You know, they, no matter how you, what you've done, you couldn't get anything right. You know, uh, the thing you've got to do here is just keep you cool. And sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you have to pull the student aside and ask him and said, if you had the authority, what would you do? You know, uh, you need to pull those people apart and figure out why they complain all the time. You're not going to change them. Uh, you just have to learn to deal with them. Now, the one that's on this list that you have to really watch is the quiet one. It's that one that all teachers like to kind of sit back in the back of the class. <clears throat> they kind of sit back in the back of the class and they don't say a lot. They don't do a lot of questions. Uh, they do their work reasonably well. Uh, most quiet students, I call them the average students. And those are the students that most teachers really like. But you, you also, just like the complainers, you need to pull them sometimes to the side and say, you know, how's life going? What's, you know, what's going on with you? You know, are you getting what we're talking about in the class? So uh, uh, yep. there's ways to deal with all of these different uh, uh, people. Uh, and you just need to, to work your own system out for how you deal with it, because we all deal with problems at, of and issues differently. So you just need to figure out and, and attack each one of these different individual personalities. Sometimes it's individual, sometimes it has to be within the, the class structure so that without embarrassing them, but you know, sometimes you have to address it within the group. A lot of times it's just some personal interaction with the student to, to calm your nerves and to calm the students. Uh, uh, personality. Good point. All right. What should the student teacher relationship be? Um, this is, um, I think, uh, another one of those issues that can pop up when you're um, too friendly or not friendly enough. Um, Pat, I'll let you lead off. It, it, if you notice, there's pretty much a theme going on in our entire presentation for professionalism, discipline, um, understanding. You know, we're mentors for these students. Um, yes, we're, we're teaching them technical stuff, um, but we're also teaching them how to go out in the workforce. And it, that relationship has to be almost, you know, as a mentor where you will guide them through doing certain things so that they understand that, you know, you're going to have a relationship, but it, it really can't be buddy-buddy. Um, it, it can't really be, you know, um, one of these things where, you know, you're, you're looking for respect, but you can't demand it. You're going to get the respect by being a professional. Um, mm -hmm. It's very hard to break that trust factor uh, once it's broken. You know, you, you, you know, scream and yell at a student while they're um, in the classroom uh, because you're having a bad day. I used to actually put in my lesson plans the irate boss day so they knew how to deal with a boss who was, you know, not having a good day because when he got out of bed, he stepped on the cat. So you, um, you know, you have to work your way through um, making sure you maintain your professionalism and you also have to maintain that discipline. But you have to understand, okay, students can have good and bad days also, and you have to you know, balance all of this stuff. Yep. Tom, anything else? Well, I, I, Pat's right right on, on track there. You're, you're a professional. You set the stage for the classroom. You have to maintain the discipline. And I would just like to interject this thought, that if you become over-friendly with your students and they become your friends, your buddies, it's almost impossible to regain control of the classroom. You can't have somebody walking up to, to you and saying, hey, Tom, I'm gonna have to leave early today at 2.30 and, 
and you say, okay, Bill, because once it becomes too personal and you don't maintain that professional distance between I'm the teacher, you're the students, not an attitude that I'm superior because I happen to know this material, but I am the teacher and you are the students. Don't become over friendly. Don't begin to socialize with them. Don't get too involved in their personal lives and so forth and so on. Treat them with respect. Demand that you be treated with respect and so forth. The actual state of Louisiana actually has an ordinance, an ordinance against students calling instructors by first name. They can call you professor, they can call you Mr. T, Mr. You know, Mr. Steve, whatever they want. But they, they know that once you get on the first name basis, it's usually downhill as far as maintaining the class. And I think the most important thing, as Pat said, is to recover that discipline and respect once you lose it. So maintain it in the beginning, not with, not with a snobbish attitude, and let them know that you're a professional, you're going to execute your part of the contract to be prepared for your classes, to teach them, to grade them, to give them everything back. You're going to have certain demands or expectations of them and keep it at that level throughout the program. And I guarantee you, you'll have happy, knowledgeable students. Keep this in mind too as the professional. Students are quite aware and they can tell by your actions, reactions, body language and so forth, whether you're going through the motions or you rather you really care about their education. Remember that you can't fool the students. Be that professional that they expect to see in front of them, just as you would want any professional teaching your students to remain professionals throughout their classes. Yeah, great point. And I, one thing that we don't have on here is uh, there's nothing wrong with a little uh, humor from time to time. I don't think it should be always, but there's time that. Um, uh, let students have a laugh, you know, take take that pressure off sometimes. Um, I I always had jokes that I would uh, insert or um, funny situations that I've uh, had when I was working out in the field. So uh, when you inject some of that stuff, just be careful how you do it. You don't want to step on anybody's toes, but there's nothing wrong with a little humor. Anybody else want to add anything? All right. Earl, I'll add a little bit. I had a motto in my class. If the student sure. wasn't smiling, he wasn't learning. You know, a, student, a student's got to be happy in his environment. And uh, so if a little joke, a little humor every now and then, uh, let's face it, teachers uh, put on an act. It's a stage act. When you're presenting a lesson, it is kind of like a theater play. You've got to set up your, you, you got to set your audience up. You, you've got to get them smiling. You've got to get them started. Uh, and uh, part of that is making them smile. So humor in class is a, is, a, is a great tool that instructors need to use. And they need to use it in a way that increases the learning potential within the, the minds of their students. Uh, the one thing that was on that list about respect, uh, I started teaching in 1980, and uh, in the 1980s, uh, it was always yes, sir, and no, ma'am. I was taught that uh, to respect my elders. So just being old gained my respect. Well, in today's society, that's not the case. Uh, you have to learn or you have to earn the respect of anybody you're dealing with and hmm. earning that respect uh, requires back, right back to that professionalism how you act around them uh, how you treat them uh, Tom alluded to your facial expressions and your uh, m motions that you make towards the students. Those are all important. But gaining respect of the student is a big issue and it will go a long way in helping you to train that individual. Agreed. All right, what's the role of an instructor? And uh, here, um, I, I think an instructor has uh, many roles they have to play. First of all, they have to be able to deal with administration. Um, some administrators I got along great with. Others, 
not so well. Um, the advisory board um, always made sure I, I picked people that was going to move the class forward, was going to really help. So, um, Pat, anything you want to add here? And I, it, as you, your advisory board gives you information of what the um, technicians they're hiring need to know and uh, you know what knowledge they should be taught and you know you then have to prepare that information you have to organize it in a way that will take the student from you know the initial introduction through that information and then you have to finally deliver that information and what the test does is it proves that the student has gained that information well uh, you know then you go back and you reinforce it um, to see if they have the retention so that when you send them out to your advisory board members they're relatively good first year technicians to start working and doing certain jobs yep uh tom anything uh well another role of the instructor and uh, most of us are aware of this but sometimes we forget things as time goes on because we're so busy and that is the, the instructor has an important role of encouraging students uh, Ooh, to uplifting point. them, to, to moving them forward, to telling them they can achieve and and also nurturing and assisting them. That, that's what we do in, in career and technical education. So uh, even when, when it talks about testing here, have meaningful tests, give immediate feedback, give them encouragement, show them where they're wrong, assist them as much as we can. Uh, those are all important roles of the instructor as well. Yeah, good point. All right, I think we're going to move on from here. What simple steps can instructors take to uh, protect themselves against issues? Um, Lim, you want to lead off here? Yeah, I've heard so many uh, new teachers and some of my accreditation visits that I've had that, well, I just don't have time to do my paperwork. Uh, well, that's not the attitude you need to take. You you really need to, to uh, uh, take care of your paperwork. It is your first line of defense. Uh, and when it comes to student issues, as the slide says, documentation is king. Yeah, if you've got it documented that you told a student uh, not to do that and he done it and got hurt in your shop, then then you're you're covered. And uh, so those type of issues are uh, very important. And verbal the verbal statements are, you know, not any uh, he said she said situation only makes matters worse so uh my simple thing to help protect yourself is to keep your documentation up uh it's uh, uh sometimes a, a pain but uh, it's something that needs to be done and once again i'll refer back to that professionalism it's part of being professional keeping your your paperwork up tom anything you'd like to add no, that says it all. If you if you if you have your documentation, you have very little explaining to do. Yeah, without documentation, there is no defense. It's that simple, Pat. You know, as I think I said before, I said and years ago it was paperwork. Today you're just documenting it, and you know maybe you'll document everything. And at the end of the school year, since we're getting close to the end of school years. Put the entire documentation on flash stick and then yep. label that flash stick 21 22 season all right and then you have all your records and it's not like you have paperwork and file cabinets all over the place um, but it's still a matter of making sure you have the records in the long run because without the records in the long run you can be opened up for liability issues yeah good point all right um avoid leaving the classroom and this is probably the toughest thing that um when we were making these slides that uh, we had a lot of discussion about and um, this is going to happen from time to time you're going to get called to the office or you may have a meeting or you might simply just want to go to the restroom and a lot of times 
you know, we're called on to uh, work on school equipment. So all of these are things that um, we find ourselves in situations. And the bottom line is, uh, I had a golden rule. If I'm not around, you don't do anything. Open your books, um, answer some questions at the end of the chapter, but um, not in the shop at this point in time. Pat? Uh, it, the exact same thing. You know, the, you, know, you have moving parts. You, know, you take a condenser, a condensing unit, it's got a moving fan. It may not have a shield on it, depending upon when you had the budget to buy it. And it's very important to not let the students be working near that equipment when you're not in the classroom. So shut it all down. Make sure there's a kill switch on your classroom to shut all the mechanical equipment down at the point where if you have to leave the room, you tell them all to sit at their desk, you hit the kill switch on your way out the door, um, and then you've got a safety issue that's been covered because the students are not going to get hurt. Tom? Uh, I, I would just like to say this, that, uh, that, that we're all going to say basically, I would imagine the same thing, and that is that students should not be engaged in any type of laboratory experiments without the instructor being present. Uh, what I think the instructors need to just keep in mind is simply this. If something did happen and things happen, and it's not likely to happen, but on occasion they do happen. The first question that's going to be asked by the administration and any attorney, if it was a serious accident, is where was the instructor when this incident occurred? And if the answer is in the front office on the telephone or at a meeting, the next question is going to be who was responsible for the by monitoring the activities in the class. So you put yourself in a very awkward uh, position by not making sure that you make the statement that everyone can hear that you're not to be doing any more live work in my absence and follow, follow that rule because you never know when something can happen. Again, I'm gonna reiterate, where were you when it happened? And why were the students allowed to work while you were not there? Protect yeah, yourself, yeah, it's that simple. Protect yourself and tell the students, have, make arrangements, do it in a, in a very positive way that the students will not be actively engaged in projects during your absence. Lim, anything you wanna add? Well, I had an incident where a student got his hand severely cut uh, in my lab. And uh, as they was taking the student to the hospital in the ambulance, the principal was in my office. And his first question was, was where was you? And I said, right here in the lab, uh, just across the room. And he said, well, you better hope that's where you you was says we've got cameras i said yep i know you've got cameras in here i said take a look at the camera you'll know exactly where i was at and what i was doing and i said you can ask the student i was working with at the time that student got hurt so uh yeah uh it's the first question that's going to be asked if a student gets hurt in your lab the first question that's going to be asked of you is where were you? Now, hopefully it's right across the lab working with another student. Your back turned, uh, you know, uh, it, it, things can happen. Uh, uh, in a second. So uh, being there, just being present in the lab is the number one thing that, that starts off. That's where it starts. And, and I can yeah. say, this student was on his way to the hospital and the principal was sitting in my office. Well, where were you, Mr. Palmer? Were you in this lab? I said, yes, sir. So all the paperwork and all the videos and all the students confirmed where I was at. So I was basically cleared, you know. Uh, yeah, Mr. Palmer was where he was at, what he was supposed to be doing. So. Yeah, you gotta watch those things. It's important. Now, yep. if, hopefully it'll never happen. Good point. Well, our next slide um, is 
again, avoid leaving in the classroom. These are some things that can go wrong. And believe me, I've seen this happen in schools. Um, things that can go wrong. First of all, we just talked about students could get hurt. But what about possible theft of stool, uh, tools, books, your tests? Um, sometimes students can wander off for various reasons. Students can get in arguments. Horseplay is a big one. Leads back to somebody getting hurt or even a fight. Tom, you want to pick up on this one? Well, we, we, we've already said don't don't leave the classroom. And where were you when all of these different things happened? Exactly. And it's not, it's unfortunate when these things happen. I just like to uh, tell a little story about and maybe suggest something in classroom management when I was not watching or left the classroom as an early instructor and shouldn't have, there was some theft of tools. And uh, it was unfortunate because at that time there were limited tools and they stole a vacuum, a vacuum pump and so forth. Uh, at any rate, uh, the way that was eventually handled was that uh, obviously the people in the classroom knew who took the tools. So I told them that, uh, you know, the theft was from the school, but that, you know, they were basically the ones that were going to uh, be affected the most because what was stolen was their ability to learn and properly use the tools of the class. So we gave the option of bringing it back, no questions asked the next morning, and that would be the end of it. And without uh, elongating this thing, that's exactly what happened. The person did bring it back, and that was the end of the issue. But uh, I've, I've had... Uh, sometimes these things can break out in class, the arguments, the horseplay, the fighting, and so yeah. forth. And they're obviously all against the uh, classroom rules, the decorum of the classroom, and they have to be dealt with on an individual basis. Again, keeping in mind that you want to be fair, you want to be consistent, you want to follow the rules, uh, you want to you know, be, you treat everyone equitably, and then find out what the resolution and what the uh, thing is going to be. But leaving the classroom, I think this says it all. It wraps it up. Don't leave the classroom because you're open to so many things that could happen within the classroom. And as we all agree to, the first question going to be asked is, where were you? Where were you? I would like to say one other thing. The, sure. reason, the reason the administration asked, where were you? When we talk about degrees of liability in court, if you were not there, then it's going to be determined that you were negligent. Uh, whether or not your state will indemnify you against a suit remains to be seen, depending on state policy uh, in their policy and procedures manual. But the state's liability will be reduced if the state doesn't protect you and says our instructor was doing something he shouldn't be doing. So keep that in mind, not to scare you, but protect right. yourself from these things initially and follow your own policies and guidelines that you set from my classroom management. Yeah, good point. All right. Um, what do we do if there's if an accident occurs? Now, um, this one's kind of up for debate a little bit. Um, we've, we've discussed this, and um, I, I guess I want to before we even start follow school policy is number one. No, you know, um, know your school policy of what to do if something happens. Um, we kind of put some things together here, and uh, Pat, you want to take off on this? You, you know, if a student needs a band aid, you're going to have a you know a, a first aid kit in the classroom. Um, but depending upon the level of injury, will depend upon how much everything gets escalated. You know, if you have a student pay attention, doesn't follow the safety requirements, um, and they possibly give themselves a shock or get electrocuted. Um, you have a whole series of things that you have to do uh, to make sure that you provide the emergency first aid, uh, get the administration involved immediately, security area, get get 911 to be there as fast as possible. You, 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 know, you, you have to have your documentation to make sure you, you Write everything down. You have a report. Ask other students that are in the classroom to contribute to those reports. What did they see? Was the student working inappropriately or were they following all the safety rules? And, you know, a classic example, student falling off a ladder. Well, was he stretching for something that he shouldn't be stretching for? 
or was he on the top step of the ladder when he shouldn't have been? He was supposed to stay two steps down, if I remember correctly, Correct. on a ladder in the last uh, few years. So it's just a matter of, of, you know, go through the motion, but provide the first aid. A Band-Aid is one thing. If it gets much more than a Band-Aid, somebody seriously cut in your classroom, let's say buy a condenser fan motor, a uh, fan of blade, really, you really have to make sure you get the, uh, the students some aid immediately and notify the administration, depending upon the school's criteria, um, will depend upon whether you know you just provide the Band-Aid or you immediately notify the administration and they take it from there and bring in the um, first aid professionals. Yeah, good point. Tom, anything? I, I would just like to say on point number six, uh, get a list of all witnesses, if possible, depending on what type of accident forms or reports you fill out. Uh, as time goes on, people forget that in case something were to emerge later in the way of a complaint, uh, you know, or 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 whatever on the part of, on the part of the injured, if it's as substantial as Pat said, an injury, get them to make a, a statement and sign it as to what they saw and witnessed that day. So you can help refresh their memory if anything would ever come out of an accident. Just get some kind of a thought of what they saw and what was going on. So they don't have to remember three months later. Lim? Well, I had a policy that if it brought blood, I filled out the school accident report uh, and was called to the office, you know, you're the only program that's reported accidents in the last six months. And I said, well, I said, you know, the student cut himself. He brought a little bit of blood. You know, uh, we put a Band-Aid on it and I filled out a report. And, you know, it seems like a, just a minute thing. But what had happened if that cut had got infected and the student come back and said, you know, well, it happened in this classroom, you're, you're gonna have to pay for my medical bills. So, uh, you know, I think if, you know, if it brings blood and your school's got an accident report, you need to, to fill something out, just kind of cover and protect yourself. So, uh, but yeah, I was all the time getting called into the office. Well, you reported two accidents in the last six months and it's looking bad on our school record. And I said, well, I said, you know, if that student had had an infection or something, you'd have been calling me in the office and thanking me for filling out the report rather than complaining. So uh, it was uh, cover cover yourself. Uh, you know, if it brings blood in your class and your school has an accident report, you need to fill one out because uh, you don't know what could happen in the future. And if you filled out that report that it happened in your class, and this is what you've done, then there you go. There's your documentation. Um, yep, those are good points. And leading into the next slide, um, you know, remember first aid and CPR training is um, necessary and should be kept up to date for all instructors. Um, I know we that um, in most of the schools that I've taught in, um, we would um, pretty much go through um, first aid and CPR training um, quite a bit. Now, when I was with the sheriff's office, uh, we actually went through first aid CPR training every month. I mean, it was never left for chance. So um, um, with the school system, I know uh, we had a, uh, safety meetings every month, but the actual first aid and CPR training, uh, every it technically, I think it's every two years, um, uh, the time frame that this has to be done. And Pat, anything you want to add? Yeah, we work on a lot of different chemicals. Um, first aid and cuts are, are, are going to happen, but when you light up a torch, somebody can get burned. And you know, burn from a torch is not funny, uh, but a burn from refrigerant is just as bad because you can literally have frostbite that can uh, really just destroy the skin on the hand. So you have to know how to treat each one of these potential issues that can happen in your classroom. The electricity, as we all discussed earlier, it can stop your heart. And it's 
it's imperative to have your first aid up to speed, your CPR up to speed. Um, get the training, get it updated, and keep it updated. Because if you don't, uh, you, you may have some student in your classroom who unfortunately passes away because of an issue that never should have happened. Yeah, good point. Tom, anything you'd like to add? No, that covers it all. Liam? I think it's pretty well covered. You you've got to got to have some training. If you're going to administer first aid, then you need to be trained in how to do it, and you need some documentation again saying, "Hey, I've been trained to do this. I know how to do it." Uh, CPR training is very very important, uh, and uh, not only for your students but for your your family and being out in the world that we're in today. So first aid and CPR training is a necessity not only for teachers but for everybody walking around you know you never know well, when you're going to need this training um and i agree lem in fact i took this a little further doing um teaching safety um i would um bring in some of the nurses to help teach cpr training it's not a bad idea to have students trained in uh first aid and cpr as well um because you never know when something's going to happen and they could be they administering um, uh, CPR first aid even before you can get there if you're across the shop. So I always thought it was a good idea to make sure even the students um, leaving your class knows how to do this stuff. All right. Oh, big one. Avoiding compromising situations. Instructors must be careful when they're uh, 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 doing stuff on their own personal social media accounts like Facebook or Twitter or what have you. Um, but I think it's extremely important to never put yourself into a compromising situation. Tom, you like to start off on this one? Well, uh, you have to take a real good look, in my opinion, at your safety program, the, the courses that you're teaching and make sure that you have accident prevention or proper training is what it really comes down to in all of the uh, materials that will be used like ladders, heavy equipment, soldering equipment, eye protection, and so forth. And the important thing again is to have some type of, a, of an examination or lecture and signing of the equipment that the uh, student is, is prepared and properly trained to use the various pieces of equipment. That again is, is, the, is the key to protecting yourself. Uh, you know, the more instructors take uh, classes on uh, learning how to prevent accidents is also a key, a key aspect of safety. And there are different things we can do in laying out our shop, storage of equipment, uh, and so forth that will help protect accidents uh, as well. So I think uh, the training of the instructor regarding uh, accident safety and making sure that all uh, safety is taught to the students and then properly documented is very important uh, regarding, in particular, and that's what this particular session is all about, how to protect yourself. Those things will help protect yourself and at the same time, guarantee a quality education. Yeah, good point. Pat? Uh, Earl, I know you, uh, you, know, you jumped the slide on the accident, uh, avoiding compromising situations, but not teaching accident prevention um, puts you in a compromising situation. So, you know, you really want to teach accident prevention. Um, students need to know how to set up ladders because if they don't learn how to set up ladders, um, they can have an issue of falling off one and all of a sudden you're back to that situation two years later. Well, I was never taught how to set this ladder up. So, you know, make sure you have the records to show that you taught accident prevention. Um, OSHA has those standards. You want to make sure those standards are followed. If you teach the accident prevention, you quite possibly can um, make sure somebody's not injured and crippled for life. Yep, good point. All right, um, talk a little bit about avoiding compromising sip, um, situations. Um, I never responded to questions that dealt with my personal life. Um, I. Um, Mr. Slide here. 
Um, let me oh, back nope, up a little bit. Far. There we go. Back. Um, go forward one. There we there go. There we go. I got it straight now. Um, compromising situations, and and this is a biggie for me. I I uh, have serious issues with any instructor that allows a student to ride in their automobile. If that student is injured or um, even killed, you're gonna be held liable. Um, that's just an absolute no-no. You, 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 just, you just don't do that. And um, the um, only bad things can happen here. Never invite a student to your home or go to a student's home uh, never be alone with some students. There are some exceptions when you have to have um, um, one on one um, conferences with a student. Um, but again, most of the time windows are open and, um, you know, just don't put yourself in a situation where you're totally alone with a student. Um, you can be accused of sexual harassment. And if you are, you will never recover from that. Um, people will always have doubt. And um, it's one you want to really stay away from is uh, getting into those situations. Tom, I know you'd like to add some stuff here. Well, I had mentioned earlier, Earl, that uh, the instructor must maintain a professional image, the leader of the class. And in, in doing that, you want to be friendly with your students, but you don't want to become their best friend for some of the obvious reasons I stated earlier, and that is, is very difficult. I think we lost time here for a second. The we lost the quorum in the class that you, you have to keep that professional relationship. Students will respond. So if you become out of time, do what? Uh, we're losing you. You're breaking what, up. Pat, you want to pick up on it? Uh, okay, T take someone else and I'll come back. Okay. Compromising situations, they're dangerous. Uh, do you have to be alone with students every once in a while? Yes. Leave the door open when you're talking to them in your office. Make sure it's got glass in it so everyone can see into that room as you're talking to them. Um, if you have to take, and there, let's say there's a, um, a convention somewhere where they'll get to see many different pieces of equipment like the ashray convention was held in new york city no in philadelphia um, when i was in the classroom and we actually took the bus down to philadelphia to see the ashray convention and let the students walk through and they couldn't believe the different pieces of equipment but you have to get permission slip signed you have to follow your school's administrative rules to make sure that everything is being followed so you don't have the libelous situations. And again, you're gonna to have to have the records to make sure the students signed those documents. They stayed in the building. They came and went with you on the bus, if that's, safe, if that's how you get there, but you just don't take them in your car. It's just a, a safety factor that you definitely wanna follow. Yeah, good point. Lim? Well, I think the uh, slide says it all. Avoid compromising in dangerous situations. That that, that covers it. Uh, you know, we're you're intelligent enough to understand that if you get into this situation, you can't get in trouble. So, avoiding those issues and situations and things are very important. Uh, he said, she said is is a mess and uh it's hard to uh uh correct so you know you just just avoid them uh you know we had an incident where the welding instructor was accused of sexually molesting a, a girl in a, a welding booth and uh oh it was a mess uh you know the whole school was affected by it you know uh he lost his job for a year and, and 
it went into courts and you know it was all the talk through the whole campus and even the students you know caught wind of it and it's it's contagious it it moved you know all the instructors were you know hyperactive about how they approach students and what they were doing within their classes so uh just avoid them if, if you think that it is going to compromise you in some way then don't do it get away from it move away uh, that's my advice tom i would just if you can hear me now i'd just yeah. like to say all of these things can be avoided again maintain that professional relationship as the instructor and the students and 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 you will all of these things will never probably happen to you yep i totally agree um Again, adding to some of this stuff, uh, dealing with personal social media accounts, um, I'm just going to run through this one pretty fast. It's cut and dry. Uh, never respond, uh, respond to personal questions. Uh, your personal life doesn't need to go into a classroom. Uh, keep it to yourself. Be careful of exchanging phone numbers. Now, sometimes, um, you know, you, you have to call students uh, in the case of an emergency. The school's going to be shut down because of um, some weather catastrophe. So, um, but you know, those phone numbers are usually in their files. So um, be careful of, of exchanging cell phone numbers. Some people can take that the, the wrong way. Uh, never exchange personal emails. You have a, a school email account, that's fine, but never exchange personal email accounts. You just never know where that's gonna go. And be careful being friends on Facebook. Um, Personally, stay away from that. It's not a place to go. Um, again, you're sharing your personal life here, and uh, I don't think those two should ever cross in the in the classroom. Tom, anything you want to add? No, I would, I would just like to reinforce what you said about keeping your personal life to yourself. Uh, if you don't, we talked earlier about when you first start your class in the morning. You're you're supposed to be excited. You're supposed to set the pace you got you're supposed to have the proper attitude and so forth so if you let your personal life affect your performance uh it, that will be recognized by the students immediately and they respond in kind by being disinterested and so forth so set that positive stage keep your personal life at home sometimes it's difficult to do depending on the situation and what you're coping with but you have to do it you're a professional put it aside do your job and then attend to whatever it is you have to attend to good point uh pat anything you want to add no just you know when when you talk about the social media of today um anything you post they're going to be able to see so you have to maintain that professionalism um you know your personal life is yours don't go sharing it out there because quite honestly the students are going to see it and if they see issues with it they're going to react in your classroom and you just don't need that so maintain that professionalism at all levels and social media is where part of those issues can crop up so just understand it's uh, it's not something you want to do as the mentor for all those students in the classroom good point all right we're getting close to the end copyright infringements and um we talked about this earlier, when you're creating or reproducing class material, there are copyright compliance issues to consider. Um, the big one is, I said earlier, never copy material and, and then sell it. Um, if you're gonna use any material, make sure you got permission to use that material um, and beware of using material off the internet. I think this is where a lot of people get in trouble is using material off the internet and um this is extremely dangerous especially bringing it into a classroom um you have to be careful here if the if if it's even um true information that you're putting out good information so um pat anything you want to add here you know copyright infringement's a major problem um you know you you can get all sorts of pictures off the internet some of them are excellent but you still have to make sure that the you're using them and it's it's with permission. Any use of something that somebody else has produced is not yours to just take. So make sure you contact them in some way 
and get their use permit and document it, have a record, keep an email, print the email or something to make sure you have permission to use their material. Yeah, good point. Tom, anything you want to add? No, I just like to caution everybody that intellectual property laws are, are very strict and you have to be really protect yourself from it. The, the rule, Earl, as you said, is just don't copy it and sell it. And as Pat said, if you're going to use something, make sure you get permission. Yeah, it's pretty much that simple. Um, our next slide is, should I as a teacher feel legal action? And, um, you know, our second bullet point here, um, just as most police officers never fire their guns in their career, um, I was a, a deputy sheriff for uh, a little over four years and I never even pulled my weapon one time, much less fired it. Uh, the only time I ever fired the weapons when I went to the range is the only time I ever got to use it. So, um, you know, um, chances are most of these things will never come up. You don't have to worry about them. You don't have to worry about legal actions. The main thing is do your paperwork. It keeps you out of all this stuff. Uh, Pat? Uh, yeah, you, you, we, we say homework. Um but it's really going back to the documentation, knowing your administration rules, your state rules, um, making sure you keep those documents in good order and you have the documents to prove that you've done what you say you did. So, um, you know, you may never have to do anything and you'll start to think, well, why am I keeping all these records? Nothing's ever happened in 10 years. Uh, you still have to have the records because something may still happen from year number one when you were teaching. So make sure you have the records, keep the records, document them. As I said earlier, with computers today, you can put your entire year's paperwork on a flash stick and just save it. And it's yep. never going to hurt to have the information because there'll be many times you might get a phone call from a, um, a contractor saying, hey, you know, um, we have this guy who wants and is applying for a job. He said he was in your class. How was he as a student? He attended your class uh, seven years ago. You can dig out that paperwork and, and show it to him. But if there's a legal action and you don't have that documentation, you've got a problem. So you may never have to incur this kind of an issue, but it never hurts to have the documentation. True. Lim? Well, I go back to the Boy Scout motto, just be prepared. You know, oh, it's point. probably not going to happen, but just just be prepared. That That's the 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 advice that I can give to any instructor. Uh, don't live in fear, but be prepared. Yep, great point. All right, uh, next slide is final thoughts. And um, uh, I had a golden rule. Number one, I never discuss politics, religion, racial issues, sexual orientation issues, or placing blame on anybody in a classroom. You stay away from these um, five things and um, stick to the HVAC topic at hand. And I don't think you're ever going to have an issue. It's when you start getting into um, these discussions with students. Um, uh, again, it's just not the place for it is in a classroom. Um, Tom? Well, Earl, first of all, I appreciate this this uh, session that we've had here. My, my final thoughts of this, I can remember back when I had to take my first classes on uh, shop safety, school safety, uh, uh, first aid, and so forth. And by the time the class was over, I would, have, I would, I would hope that someone that doesn't have the same feelings listening to us that I had, and that was, I was afraid. I was afraid to do anything in the classroom for fear I was gonna lose my job or something was gonna happen. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say what, what Lem said, and that's what I intended to say is, the best thing to do is protect yourself. Protect yourself by having the knowledge of all of the things that could possibly happen and following all the rules, regulations, policies, and procedures that are in place. Awareness is, is the key to everything. If you're aware of it, keep it in your mind, you understand your roles, and, and what can ha possibly happen, and you're covering yourself with the documentation and all, then leave this session knowing 
that you're going to do a good job and a better job for yourself and for your students, and you'll be protecting yourself and your family and your school and your reputation. That's all it comes down to. But don't let any of these things we've said put you in a frame of mind where you're fearful to go out there right. and do anything. That was not the intention of this session at all. It was to give you some things to think about so that you would, in fact, be protected and be prepared for any scenario or situation that could come up. Yeah, great point. Pat, your final thoughts? Tom's right. We are here to reinforce for you the ways you have to do things. Um, we shouldn't be terrifying you. We should be giving you, and which we hope we are, giving you information to use in the classroom to make the process of becoming a teacher and making the next generation of technicians a smooth and, and seamless process. Um, you know, a lot of these things that you know you're do you're going to be doing in the classroom were things you did on the job site. You kept records of all sorts of things on the job site. So you're basically just transitioning into a different professional area. But it's important to understand you don't have any fear. Just do the do the things that's necessary, follow the administrative rules, document everything, and you'll be fine. Yeah, great point. Lem. Your final thoughts? Well, I, you know, first of all, oh, you got to understand that instructors, teachers, educators, they're not made. You got to make yourself. And how you make yourself depends on your professionalism and the things that you learn and you listen to. Uh, all this information here today is is, is information. Uh, you need to apply it to your situation and look at it from your point of view, and uh, you'll become a better classroom teacher. You'll become a better person too. So uh, my closing thought is good luck to all you teachers out there, and I hope you've enjoyed the session. Uh, great thing, uh, Lem. Thanks, everybody. Um, I I you know, would like to say we'll pass the torch on to a lot younger generation and um, we want you to be as successful as we were in our career. So um, uh, again, thank you for your time. If you have any questions, you can contact us through the ESCO office. Again, everybody, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.